Hey, and welcome back. Today we're starting with Season 2 of The X-Files, which I cannot wait to dig into. Today's episode is Little Green Men, Episode 1 of Season 2. Debuting on the Fox Network September 16th, 1994, Little Green Men follows Agent Mulder as he travels to Puerto Rico to investigate the sudden reactivation of a SETI-like communication station. And for anyone that doesn't know SETI, it's a term meaning the search for extraterrestrial intelligence using various scientific methods, including monitoring electromagnetic radiation to listening for transmissions from any civilization from galaxies far, far away. The episode begins with a brief history lesson by Mulder on the search for extraterrestrial life. The X-Files have been shut down and Mulder's search for the truth squashed, that is until a long dormant site receives a transmission from what could possibly be alien. We, are we step out of our solar system into the universe Seeking only peace and friendship to teach. Agent Mulder has been reduced to listening to wiretaps about guys frequenting strip joints. And without Scully around, he really is a slob. Scully, meanwhile, is back to teaching at the FBI Academy when she becomes all sentimental over some corpse she has no relation to. Are you okay, Agent Scully? You kind of sounded a, a little spooky. Uh-oh, it looks like Mulder is starting to rub off on her. Look, I understand the X-Files have been shut down and they're no longer working together, but would it kill Mulder to say hi? Mulder finds a sticky note on a picture of his sister, and this is what, the third little girl now to portray his sister at this point? Meanwhile, at Deep Throat's old stomping grounds, Mulder and Scully have a little after-hours rendezvous because they're not supposed to see one another. You know, Mulder, from... from back there you look like him. Him? Deep Throat. I don't know about that, Scully. I mean, he's a little better looking than Deep Throat. Mulder is a tad paranoid because he believes the two of them are still being watched, but Scully assures him she's taken all the necessary precautions. Although she did take a pen that was spying on them from a random woman, so I don't know how thorough she is. Scully is starting to doubt Mulder's commitment for the truth, as he's been like a zombie since the X-Files were shut down. And you're worried that all your life you've been seeing elves? In my case, little green men. I think Mulder is having visions of the Great Gazoo. In my case, little green men. Scully tells Mulder he's seen so much, but Mulder points out that's what's wrong. He's seen, but has no proof. He's on the verge of giving up completely, but cheerleader Scully, despite never believing him, tells him not to give up. We're now back in the past as a young Mulder plays a board game with his sister in the living room, and I'm glad I'm not the only one who had to endure an annoying little sister. Mom and Dad's like, what's the movie? That much. They're next door at the Galbrins, and they said I'm in charge. Hey, get out of my life! Instantly I regret saying that! Suddenly the power goes out, and I'm sure it's just a fuse. The entire house starts to shake, and it looks like there's a sweet rave going on outside. The front door opens and a light floods the house, while something stands in the doorway. Mulder awakes from his nightmare, but I have to address a couple things. In the pilot, Mulder tells Scully his sister was in bed when she disappeared, but we can clearly see they're playing in the living room. She just disappeared out of her bed one night. Just gone. Vanished. No note. No phone calls, no evidence of anything. And in the episode Conduit, during his hypnotic regression, he claims he's paralyzed in his bed while his sister calls for him. I just lie there in bed. Can you see your sister? No. But I can hear her. Continuity, people. Just then he's visited by some guy who brings Mulder to Senator Matheson. A senator who has taken somewhat of a liking to his work, and we will see him a few times throughout the series. Do you know this, Fox? It's Bach. Brandenburg Concerto number three. Two. Good thing it wasn't a double jeopardy question. Yes, select again. Bible for 400, please. During the second plague, these amphibians came out of the water. Stephen. What are frogs? Right. What are frogs? 
Matheson is going on about classical music and Mulder just looks at him like, your point. Mulder apologizes for getting the X-Files shut down and tells him he thinks they were close. To what? I don't know. Well, at least now I don't have to say it. The music stops and the senator writes Mulder a note telling him someone is listening to them. He plays some more music and explains to Mulder about the station in Puerto Rico that started back up. What am I looking for? Contact. Well, it looks like Mulder has just up and disappeared without a trace and... Dinner? ...doesn't appear to be all too happy about it. Cigarette Smoking Man, on the other hand, is more interested in finding more cigarettes. Mulder arrives at the lush Canadian-looking forest of Puerto Rico. He is stopped by a barbed wire fence, but manages to, I guess, just walk around it? I guess the fence only goes so far? Like a Boy Scout, he's always prepared and brings his trusty bolt cutters. He surveys the station, taking note of what he sees, and finds the equipment up and running. Meanwhile, Scully is in his apartment just snooping through all his stuff. Mulder, you hounded me to have lunch with you today, and then you don't show. You're a pig. Since when does Mulder have time to hound anyone? She tries getting access to his computer. And hey, spooky is my thing. I definitely didn't steal it from Mulder. How did she manage to get the correct password on her third try anyway? Most of the time when I try logging into my own email, it tells me I have the wrong password and then I have to go change said password and it tells me you can't use the previous password. She starts printing off a document when some fellow agents arrive as Mulder's place is under surveillance. And they grab said document but luckily they're idiots so they throw it in the garbage. Scully is like the David Blaine of the FBI because Larry and Moe here don't notice her take the document. I forgot Mulder was in this episode for a second. Looks like nature calls, but why does this place even have a bathroom? It's in the middle of a rainforest. Well, this here is Jorge and he has seen some shit. But how did he even manage to get inside this place when it was chained off from the outside? Did you say men? Hombres. <laughs> Meanwhile, Scully is having the document she downloaded looked at by a doctor. Apparently what she has is the best evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence ever recorded. She goes over an airline passenger manifest and stops at George E. Hale knowing that's Mulder because Georgie e. Hale is a long-dead astrophysicist and only Mulder would use a name like that. Mulder reads over the printout from the transmission as Jorge sort of just pushes buttons. The same message is transmitted. No! Jorge, don't touch that red button. No ho on the rojo. Stop that! The equipment turns back on and Jorge loses his mind as he believes the men from the sky are coming back. The machine starts emitting this ear-piercing sound and Jorge is getting the hell out of here. Mulder goes to search for Jorge, but when he finds him, he's dead, frozen in fear. Well, kind of frozen, the actor is moving somewhat. At the airport, Scully is being followed, but these two fail at making it not look too obvious. She places a call to Mulder's answering machine and leaves some coordinates or something. I honestly don't know what the hell she's talking about. CA 519. 705 She fakes placing another call when the two following her are alerted that she's about to board a flight. Yet when they turn to see her, she's pulled to Batman and completely disappeared. Relax, we know where she's going. St. Croix. Caribbean Air Flight 519 takes off at 5 after 7. Gates in the other terminal. Alright, I guess those numbers she left on his machine weren't so random after all. Scully has pulled the ultimate trick though as she's taking a completely different flight. Mulder is recording his observations of Jorge's body, and I must say, he's very good at making it look like he isn't breathing. My god, Scully, it's as if he's been frightened today. Mulder starts doubting why he's there, remembering Deep Throat's words of trust no one. He then says what would he do if he really found them, if they really came. And right on cue, the whole place starts shaking again as something has returned. 
Are we sure these are aliens and not Kandarian demons? The door comes flying open and Mulder desperately closes it and tries to block it off with the equipment. Well, I guess these aliens aren't so tough to beat after all. Guns apparently aren't the answer, but look how damn scrawny these things are. Just bulldoze the damn thing over. Mulder wakes up and there's an angel. Well, it's just Scully, but eh, it's close enough. Mulder is super amped though because he believes the recordings are finally proof of what took his sister. These printouts. It's here. And the man. We'll have to examine the body. There'll be more proof. I love the look on Scully's face when he reveals Jorge's body, because here's Mulder rambling on about aliens like a lunatic, and there also just so happens to be a dead man there as well. Well, no time for love, Dr. Jones, because the crash retrieval team are on their way. Mulder grabs the recordings, and they book it just as the team arrives. Hold your fire! Get that truck to the bottom of the hill! Ah, look at those lovely Puerto Rican pine trees. These guys are supposed to be the best, but a couple agents just got away in a truck with really little effort. Skinner, of course, is chewing Mulder out, but Mulder's leave it to beaver haircut makes him look like he's about 12 years old. Let alone wiretap my phone, an illegal procedure without a court order. Skinner, clearly oblivious to any kind of wiretapping, is starting to have some suspicions of his own. Your time is over, and you leave with nothing. Get out. I said, get the hell out. And just like that, Skinner forgets everything that just transpired and asks Mulder to continue the surveillance he was doing prior. It should be right here. The entire tape is blank. Mulder just can't catch a break, can he? Well, it looks like after all that, he's got nothing. I still have you. I love myself. Little Green Men is a great season opener. We get more backstory into just what happened the night of his sister's disappearance, even though it slightly differs from what was established with the pilot episode and Conduit just a bit. But these things happen. Apparently writers Morgan and Wong never saw the episode Conduit before they wrote this one, so that's part of the reason for the inconsistency. It's interesting to see Mulder nearly lose all hope, if not for the pressure from Scully to keep searching for the truth. We also get a bit more of Skinner in this one, and the little interaction at the ending gives us a little glimpse into what he'll bring for the remainder of the show. Yeah, he's a hard ass and wants things done by the book, but he also knows when things aren't what they seem and will do what's right. Now imagine if the actual FBI had people inside with this kind of integrity. Little Green Men sits at a very high 8.1, which is most definitely deserved. With the closing down of the X-Files, writers Glenn Morgan and James Wong saw this season opener as more of a second pilot. They wanted to explore Mulder questioning himself on whether he should continue after the death of Deep Throat and everything that happened to both Scully and himself. In the pilot episode, Mulder states, The only reason I've been allowed to continue with my work is because I've made connections in Congress. The introduction of Senator Matheson could be this connection that he was alluding to in that episode. Little Green Men was featured in a play called Recent Alien Abductions by Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, and I'm sure I just butchered his name. In the play, a Puerto Rican man believes the episode has been censored or altered due to a Hollywood government alien conspiracy to hide the truth from the citizens. I started to write down the details of the episode. Not just the plot, but its entire sequence. Originally, Senator Matheson was supposed to be played by Darren McGavin, who starred in Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Now that's a series I need to dig into. Kolchak reports the bizarre, the supernatural, the unexplainable. You will get it, another crazy story. This nut thinks he is a vampire. But because of his scheduling conflict, he was unable to play the role. He does appear in the season 6 episode Aquamalo though, as former FBI agent Arthur Dales, who just so happens to be the first agent to ever look into the X-Files. This episode was a passion project for writer Glenn Morgan, as he had a keen interest in the SETI project. He originally wanted to write an episode featuring Deep Throat, but it never came to fruition at the time. Once he was able to write the episode, he was hoping it would lead to more children wanting to learn about the SETI project, which had been shut down by the government, and this really ticked him off. 
Little Green Men achieved a Nielsen rating of 10.3 and was viewed by 9.8 million people, which I think most shows these days wish they had half that audience. This episode is another excellent one and a great opener for Season 2. A definite recommendation if you've never seen it. We go from one banger to another, as next up is one of my all-time favorites, The Host. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, please think about subscribing. Let me know down in the comments what you think of Little Green Men. Thank you for watching and stay spooky. Coming Friday, the FBI has turned against them. We must assume we're being watched. The government is trying to kill them. Now Agent Scully and Mulder are about to make their most startling discovery. Contact. No! The X-Files season premiere Friday.